Thank you. It's a wonderful to be here today. Thanks for coming out. Oh, sorry, we need to go back again. There we go. So, every day, billions of people buy clothes with nary a thought about the consequences of those purchases. Shoppers snap up five times more clothing today than they did in 1980. That average is 68 garments a year. As a whole, the world's citizens acquire $80 billion a billion apparel items annually. On average, average, each piece will be worn seven times. In China, I've been told, it's three times. And if the population swells to 8.5 billion by 2030, and the GDP per capita rises by 2%, in, developing, in developed nations and 4% in developing economies in those intervening years, as experts predict. And if we don't change our consumption habits, we will buy 63% more fashion, from 62 million tons to 102 million tons. All of this is by design. In airports, you can pick up an entire wardrobe on your way to the gate. In Tokyo, you can score a tailored suit from a vending machine. Love that outfit on Instagram? Click, click, and it's yours. Walk into a fashion store. Techno thumps. The surfaces gleam. The light is desert sharp. Ah the better to see the abundance of offerings. Price becomes curiously moot. You're so beguiled and so overstimulated, you forget to consider such fundamentals as quality. You spend freely, recklessly even, and though you've probably been rooked, you feel like you've won. And none of it, none of it is sustainable. The World Bank estimates that the fashion sector is responsible for nearly 20% of all industrial water pollution annually. It releases 10% of the carbon emissions in our air. One kilogram of cloth generates 23 kilograms of greenhouse gases. The fashion industry devours one-fourth of chemicals produced worldwide. The creation of one cotton t-shirt requires a third of a pound of lab-concocted fertilizers, 25.3 kilowatts of electricity, and it can take up to 2,700 liters of water to grow the cotton for that shirt. Synthetic fibers, fabrics, release microfibers into the water when washed, both at mills and at home. Up to 40% enter rivers, lakes, and oceans, and are ingested by fish and mollusks and worm their way up the food chain to us. In 2016, nearly 20% of fresh wheat, seawater and freshwater samples tested by the Global Microplastics Initiative contained microfibers. I've since heard that there are microfibers in the ice of Antarctica, and it's raining microfibers in Colorado, in the Colorado Rockies. Of the more than 100 billion items of clothing produced each year, 20% go unsold, the tertitis of the economies of scale. Leftovers are usually buried, shredded, burned, in the last 20 years, the volume of clothes Americans throw away has doubled from 7 million to 14 million tons. That equals 80 pounds of clothes per person per year. The Environmental Protection Agency reported that Americans sent 10.5 million tons of textiles, the majority of which were clothes, to landfill in 2015. The EPA during the Trump administration has not released an updated figure. In the UK, 
9,513 garments are dumped every five minutes. Just since I've been talking here, 10,000 garments went in the trash. Textiles are the country's fastest growing waste stream. Most clothing contains synthetics, and most synthetics are not biodegradable. But all is not lost. There is a host of change makers out there fighting for a cleaner, better fashion process to protect Mother Earth. Here I'm gonna give you a little side, side talk. This picture was taken by my cousin from the International Space Station. You can Instagram him, Astro Ricky. <laughs> and that's Hurricane Florence stirring. I thought it seemed appropriate somehow. Many of these change makers I discovered while working on my book, Fashionopolis, are women. Like Florence, my hurricane. And like Sarah Bellows, the 33-year-old founder and head of Stony Creek Colors, a natural indigo dye company in Goodlettsville, Tennessee. Natural indigo was the only indigo you know, since the dawn of time, until about 100 years ago, when the German chemical company, BASF, created a synthetic version. Unlike natural indigo, synthetic wasn't seasonal, and it wasn't vulnerable to blight and weather destruction by things like my Hurricane Florence. It was consistent and cheap, this meant mills like cone denim could weave and dye denim 12 months a year. By 1914, the natural indigo business had been annihilated, never to recover. Today, almost all the denim we wear, 99.9% .9 is dyed with synthetic indigo, which is made of chemicals including benzene, cyanide, and formaldehyde which are toxic and harmful to humans. The economies aren't there for people to care, Sarah told me. Pollution is the cheapest way to do business. Bellows is trying to change that mindset. Natural indigo's plants nourish the soil, and in the long term, natural indigo is more financially beneficial than synthetic for most everyone along the supply chain. When we met in 2016, Sarah told me she was, Sarah was the lone and sole producer of natural indigo on an industrial scale in the United States. That was it, right there, what you see behind me. Cone Denim and Patagonia were among her clients. Her goal back then was to command 1% of the entire denim industry because you know we're at 99.99% right now. She said, if I can get 1% by 2021, that would be phenomenal. Two years later, when I rang her to see how things were going, she said that figure had jumped to 2.8% by 2024. She thought she was gonna get about 3% of the market in just a couple of years. And she hopes she's inspiring others, so it'll pop up to 10, maybe 20 or 30%. Give us some choice. I certainly hope so. Then there's Sally Fox. Sally Fox is considered by many in the industry to be the mother of modern organic cotton. I see her sort of as like the Jill Goodacre, or Jill Goodall of cotton. Or I'm sorry, Jane Goodall of cotton. Throughout her career, Fox has fought the good fight with, a, with middling success. Conventional cotton farmers in the southwest of America did their best to quash her endeavors. Levi's first applauded, encouraged, and even contracted her to supply the company with her organic cotton. When I met her, she was wearing jeans made of, their, of her organic cotton that had been made in the early 90s. But in a management shakeup in the, in the mid-90s, Levi's abruptly cut her loose, a move that led to her bankruptcy. Yet, she's never given up. 
tenacity. Now on Veradita's farm, her 130-acre stead on northwest, northwest of Sacramento, Northern California, she still breeds and nurtures cotton, as well as raises sheep, as we can see, for wool, and farms crops that sequester carbon and build topsoil. For her, this is the only way forward. Right now, the climate goal from the Paris Accord is 0.4% carbon sequestration per acre per year, she said. We have to get the carbon out of the atmosphere before there's no return. Last month, Fox met Bellos on Al Gore's sustainable farm in Tennessee. They're talking about how they can work together. There's a fashion industry veteran named Stacy Flynn of Evernew, the Seattle-based company that produces molecularly regenerated fiber made of 100% post-consumer cotton garment waste. In other words, your old t-shirts and underwear. Evernew consumes 98% less water than virgin cotton, produces 80% less greenhouse gas emissions than polyester, viscose or elastane, such as spandex and lycra, emits zero plastic microfibers, causes zero deforestation, and requires zero farmland. Like for most of the women I met while researching my book, when Flynn first pitched her idea to investors, such as her reps at her former employer Target, she was told that she was crazy. But she and her business partner, industry vet Christo Stanev, kept at it and landed some funding and eventually inked a deal with Levi's to create prototype jeans made of Evernew. I've seen them. They look just like jeans made from virgin cotton. Levi's head of innovation, Paul Dillinger, called them an industrial, a little industrial miracle. Soon, Dillinger told me, Evernew will be introduced into Levi's broader supply chain as a material. As it happens, Flynn met Sarah Bellows at an accelerator last year, and they too have stayed in touch. Imagine if Bellows could supply her natural indigo to, to dye Evernew's regenerated cotton. Talk about green jeans. Then there's Natalie Channon of Alabama Channon, a slow fashion brand in Florence, Alabama, that specializes in organic cotton clothes sold direct to consumer via the internet. Before NAFTA was enacted in 1994, Florence, Alabama was the cotton t-shirt capital of the world. Ralph Lauren, Tommy Hilfiger, and Walt Disney all produced there. After NAFTA, Florence, like much of the textile-driven South, plunged into financial and social crisis. In 1993, 5,000 workers in this two-block radius, or 5,000 workers worked in this two-block radius, Natalie told me when I visited her factory. And that didn't include all the service industries, restaurants, daycare, gas stations. There used to be 20 dye houses in this town. When manufacturing collapsed here, she said, everything collapsed. Florence native, a Florence native, Channon began her career in fashion on New York's 7th Avenue. In 2006, she moved her business back home and embraced what her fellow Florentine and singer-songwriter John Paul White calls the nurturing benefits of a small town. Everything at Alabama Channon is made to order, sewed by local seamstresses. 
To train more machinists, Channon has partnered with Nest, a New York-based nonprofit that supports artists and fashion communities around the world. Channon concedes that implementing a more ethical business fashion model hasn't been the most lucrative way to run her business. And there are times, she says, that she misses the deeper connection to the industry and the heartbeat of what's happening in design in America, being in her small town rather than the big city. But the advantages of being hyperlocal outweigh all that. When the difficult times come, and they do, her overhead and her expenses are so low she can ride on through. She is 100% self-owned, has no debt, and her business practice is zero waste. There are plenty of other pro-green change makers out there, big and small. Like designer Stella McCartney, who is the leader of the conscious fashion movement, clothes that in her case are animal free and as sustainable as possible. There's Cindy Rhodes, an American expat in London who founded Worn Again Technologies, a company that has developed a patented process that separates, decontaminates, and extracts polyester and cotton cellulose from pure and blended fabrics. So basically, when you have a poly cotton blend, they manage to separate them, decontaminate them, and like Stacy Flynn, regenerate each of them into virgin quality material again. Circular, Rhodes told me, is the future. It brings fashion and head on with brings fashion head on with reality. Though their efforts are born out of concern for the planet, all of these companies are proving that sustainable practices are better for the bottom line. More importantly, they are pushing for what the Greek philosopher Plato called an ideal polis, one that should embody four cardinal virtues, wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice. If we achieve all of that, we will have a just city, a fashionopolis. And isn't that what we should all want? Thank you. <laughs>